Church, you guys look amazing. Everybody at every campus, it is good to have you at church with us today. Malbus, can you help me? And let's welcome all of our brothers and sisters that are at every other campus, all of our rooms. It is good to have everybody in church today. One house, many rooms, right? It's pretty cool. It's pretty awesome that God is using us in that way. Um, one thing, just before I jump into this week's uh, message, I just wanted to kind of point back uh, for a moment to worship today, um, just how incredible that story was that we got to that we got to witness and just worship as a whole. Um, can we just thank God for what He did, what He did last weekend? And that's and that's just one story. I'm sure there have been tons and tons of stories, um, but there's no way that you sat and watched that. Um, no, no matter where you are on the faith spectrum or journey, if you're in the negatives or if you're, you know, kind of in the middle or maybe you've been here a little while, um, there's no way that that didn't boost your faith and build your faith in some way to hear and to see what God is doing right here um, in our church and just such an incredible thing. So, um, so anyway, and also just real quick, can we just honor our creative teams for putting worship and video and being able to communicate that to us? Man. So incredible. Every campus, all of our creative teams are just absolutely, uh, just amazing. So anyway, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to jump in to part five of Jesus. Um, this series so far has been incredible, and I have enjoyed it. I'm sure you have as well. Um, and I'm excited that today I get to pick up part five. Uh, today we're talking about Jesus the teacher, um, which I'm excited about. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit, kind of a different thought, but, um, but I, I know many of you, and actually probably all of you, have had a teacher at some point, right? No? Okay, yeah, we've all had teachers, right? And there's one thing for sure that I know is that every single one of us in this room have had a bad teacher. You're right, right? Come on. Right, every single one of us have had at least one bad teacher. Now, odds are you've had multiple and yeah, we'll clap for that, sure. Um, right, but then here's the other thing. The other side of that is that we've all had great teachers. Right, we've all had, let's give it up for the great teachers. The world needs more of those, right? Um, for sure, man, we need amazing, inspiring teachers. You know, not teachers that are just, you know, checking a box and just trying to get through something, but teachers that are interested in a student taking them into another world, taking them, expanding their mind and teaching and training and inspiring them, right? That's the kind of teacher that we need. And my guess is there are people here that because of a teacher, you wound up in the profession that you're in today. Because a teacher, maybe it was in college, maybe it was in high school, that a teacher just expanded your mind and you didn't even think something was possible and there was an idea, a concept, and you ran that direction. Or maybe some of you guys, you found yourself in college and you had this major and you weren't super excited about it, but you had to go take this random elective. And through that elective, the teacher just blew your mind and it totally changed your major. It changed the course of your life all because of a teacher. Teachers are so important to what we do. And the thing that we know, without any doubt whatsoever, is that Jesus Christ was the greatest teacher who ever lived. Without a doubt, Jesus Christ was the greatest teacher who ever lived. And it's not just the preacher man that says that. Okay, because that would, that would make sense, right? In church, we kind of have to say that, right? But actually, scholars, both secular and Christian, even atheists, say that Jesus Christ was the greatest teacher that ever lived. Even if they don't stand by or live for the doctrine or the theology or, the, the, that, or that he was Savior, even if they don't believe any of that, they would still say that he taught in such a way that was mind-blowing, that just astonished every single person that listened to him. And we have record of this. Throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospels, we see that when Jesus speaks... Whenever Jesus shares something, we see these responses all over the place. And the, and the first one from the book of, I believe it's Matthew, it says this, after he got done teaching, it says he taught them in their synagogue and they were astonished. Again, Matthew said after, after a teaching, they said the crowds were profoundly impressed. And then we go into the next one, it says people were so enthusiastic about Jesus' teaching. And then Mark says this, he says the great crowd enjoyed listening to him. This is interesting. There wasn't a whole lot of enjoying going on back then. The great crowd enjoyed listening to him. These crowds had never heard anyone speak to them the way that Jesus did. 
They were spellbound by his delivery. Just spellbound. There's a story that John tells that I think is quite interesting that the high priest who didn't like Jesus, they didn't like Jesus' teaching because he was gaining a following. People were beginning to listen to him, and so they didn't like him at all. He, they were, he was kind of going against some of the things that they had said. And, um, and so the, the high priest send the police basically to go get Jesus. They send the temple guards, hey, go get Jesus, arrest him, and bring him back. And what's really funny, and, and, and Mark kind of, or I'm sorry, John kind of lays this out, that they go to arrest him. And of course, Jesus is teaching. And so they walk into the room, and you can imagine Jesus teaching, and they go to arrest him, and they're like, well, it's kind of awkward. There's like a lot of people here. Maybe we'll just wait till he's done, and then we'll arrest him. And then they started listening to what he said. And they went back empty-handed to the high priest, and they were like, what in the world? You're supposed to be bringing back a guy. Like, you're supposed to be bringing this guy back. And they're like, well, we started listening to him. And we had never heard anyone speak in that way. So they went to arrest him, and they came back saved. Empty-handed, but saved. And actually, this is the way that John says it. He says, no one ever spoke the way that this man does. When they come back to the high priest, they say, man, we've, we've never heard teaching like this before. We've never heard someone speak in such a way that this man speaks. Now, something you need to know about the first century was that teaching and life was very different then. But this group of people that lived in this time, they were no, they were no strangers to teaching. They were, they were taught to death almost to some degree. Um, the way that this culture was at that point, they were taught almost daily by scribes and rabbis and the different synagogues and all the different things that were going on. But even from children, by the time a child was 10 years old, they didn't go to normal school or school to learn a trade or school to learn things. They, they did all that through mom and dad. They went to school for religious studies. That's, they went and sat under a rabbi and they just, they learned and they learned the scriptures. But by the age of 10, they, could mem they had the, the entire Torah memorized, which was the first five books of the Bible. Can you imagine that by 10 years old, these kids could recite the first five books of the Bible, which is a lot of stuff, right? And you got Genesis and Exodus, which are great, but after that, you kind of start falling asleep. Anybody with me there? Right? If I were to say the word Deuteronomy, and you'd be like, you just fall asleep. It's just like, man, I can't even get through. These kids memorized it. They knew it. They had it in them, and then as they got older and older, they would memorize the entire Old Testament. This is what their studies were made of. They were taught and taught and taught and taught. But yet when Jesus taught, something else happened. And we've read the stories that people by the, by the multitudes would follow him out into the countryside, into the valleys, into the in, in, way off the beaten path. Thousands of people would follow him to listen to his teaching. And they would get to these places, and then they'd realize after a couple hours of teaching, I didn't bring no snack. Right? They'd get to these places, and they'd go, man, I don't even know where I am. Like, we've just been walking. We followed this guy, and he's been teaching, and now I don't have a place to stay. I don't have any food. Because they were enthralled. They were so engaged in what he was saying that they would go anywhere to listen to this man's teaching. Because he taught completely different than what they'd ever known before. Even though they were taught and taught and taught and taught, the way Jesus taught was totally different. So I want to look at a couple of things that made Jesus' teaching just different. Why did he stand out? Why did he attract this kind of crowd? Why did these people just flock to him? And why were their minds blown every single time they heard him open up his mouth? Every single time he would teach something, they would go, oh my goodness, like, this is just unreal. This is astonishing. I've never heard teaching like this. And the first one is this. The first thing that made Jesus stand out is this, is that he was unauthorized. He was unauthorized. He was unofficial, if you will. Like I said a, a minute ago, whenever a, a child was growing up in the Jewish custom, at around age 13 or 14, they would have had the entire Old Testament memorized, by the way. Um, and at this point, they would go and begin just working with their parents. They would learn their dad's trade or their mom, or they would just kind of, that's, that's the route that they took. They would pick up a trade, which is fishermen or carpenters. We've talked about that, right? But the elite, the Jewish elite, those kids that just excelled in their religious studies, they would take the next step in kind of a Jewish seminary. It was called Bet Midrash. Basically, they would go to a rabbi and they would plead and beg and they would, and they would ask this, this, this rabbi to accept them into their school or basically to become one of their disciples. 
And they would go to these rabbis and they would petition them. And they would say, hey, I know all of my stuff. I've got it all down. Will you train me to become a rabbi like you are? And this was like Jewish seminary. This was like the next level. Most kids said, nah, I'm going to go fish. Most kids said, nah, I'm going to go build tables with dad. Most kids did that. But then the elite would say, no, no, I'm going to go and I'm going to become a rabbi. As far as we know, Jesus never did that. Jesus never took that next step. We know that Jesus became a carpenter. He went and he went with his dad and he learned the trade and he became a carpenter. He never did that. However, there's the, the, the most famous sermon that Jesus preached was called the Sermon on the Mount. And if you've never read it, it's Matthew 5 through 7. It's an amazing passage. It's an amazing sermon, what Jesus does. But Jesus had been healing and had been doing all these incredible things and he looks up and he realizes, man, there's a ton of people following me. I need to take advantage of this. So he kind of climbs this hill and he begins to teach. And a couple of years ago, I got to go on the Israel trip and we got to tour the land. And um, there's a few of you guys that are going to be going in a couple of weeks. Um, it's absolutely incredible. But you'll, those of you that are going, you'll get to see the spot where they believe the Sermon on the Mount happened. I've actually got a picture of it right here. Um, this, is, this is the spot. There's the Sea of Galilee. It's absolutely beautiful. This is Pastor Tim. Pastor Tim, wee little fella right there. See? Let's put it in my pocket. Um, but this is the spot that they believed that Jesus was healing in all these neighboring towns and he was coming through and he looked here, he'd been healing people and he goes, man, there's a lot of people, I, I need to take advantage of this and teach. So he climbs up on this hill, he probably stands on the same rock Pastor Tim's sitting on, I don't know. And he stands there and he begins to teach. And he begins to teach. And this is the longest sermon that we have recorded. And at the end of this passage, and it's all red because it's Jesus, and at the very end there are two verses in black. Because Matthew steps in, and Matthew says this at the very end in verse 28. He says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Now listen to this. Because he taught as one who had authority, and not as, the teach, as their teachers of the law. Now remember, Jesus didn't go through all the schooling. Jesus didn't become an official rabbi. Jesus had no papers. He had no, no policy. He had, he had nothing. He, he hadn't been dubbed any kind of rabbi or priest, scribe, nothing. Okay. Yet whenever he opened up his mouth, the people were blown away and they noticed he had an authority. But it wasn't anything like what they were used to. Trust me, they were used to these guys. They had authority. They just didn't have the same authority that Jesus had. When Jesus showed up, he taught with a completely different level of authority. He didn't have any, any papers. He didn't have, you know, any official status. But yet he taught different with this incredible, incredible authority. This word authority, authority is extremely important. It's not used a whole lot, but then when it's, once it is used, it means this. It means that it's out of the original stuff is what it means. Out of the original stuff. The, the root word comes from the same word that we get author, which is very interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus Christ is the author of life. So what these people were seeing when he's standing on this rock, he's standing on this mountain and he's preaching, he's teaching, he's blowing minds, he's expanding their idea of what, of what God is. What, what, what the, he's actually doing is he's speaking into their core, into their heart, because he created them. He authored them. He, he created the life that they breathe. We sang that song a little while ago that it's his air in our lungs that we breathe, right? He speaks with a whole other level of authority that people just didn't even understand that he could, with a multitude of people, thousands of people listening to him, he could speak to one person. And on the inside of their heart, they're going, man, how did, how did he know that? How did, how did that just happen? How did that just expand? How did that just go off in my mind? Why? Because he's the author of their life. He created their life. He created all of our lives. So when Jesus taught, he didn't just teach out of just any authority. He taught out of original authority. Let me say it this way. Jesus taught about life with original authority rather than derived authority. Every other teacher of the law, every rabbi, scribe, synagogue, high priest, everybody else, it was an authority that had been passed down from generation to generation to generation. It was something that everybody knew. It was just something that was normal. It was something that was just, that they, they, they just, it was common. And Jesus came along with original authority because he created the world. 
He was there when God spoke to Abraham. He was there when God created the world. He was there all through the Bible. He was there through it all. He's not picking up something from somebody else. He's picking it up from the original source. And he's delivering that kind of life to every single human being. It's the original author who's bringing life to people. And this is the reason why they sat dumbfounded. How does this man know everything about me? How does this man look into my heart and know what I'm dealing with and what I've battled and how many ex-husbands I have? or how, many, how does he know this about me? Why? Because he authored your life. He created the air that is in you, the air that you're breathing right now. So when he opened his mouth, he talked differently from the other teachers because he had an authority that was completely different. The second thing that made Jesus stand out in his teaching was that he was just unorthodox. He was just unorthodox. Every other scribe in this day would have taught very, very complicated, very, very deep. Their idea of teaching would have been, let's see how deep we can go. Um, actually, there, there are people that say that in that day, their goal was to teach over the heads of their students. That was like, that was like a trophy of, of being scholarly. If I can teach at a level that no one gets. Does anybody know that person, by the way? Right, that you're like, hey, buddy, we're human beings. Come on down here. Let's talk. Like, get out of the clouds, get out of your mumbo-jumbo crazy stuff. You know, I know you're smart and all, but get on down here with real people. Right? That, that's what these people did. They just taught at such a level that it was, it was the, the, the goal was to be as deep and theologically, you know, mumbo-jumbo nonsense that they could possibly get. And people just didn't get it. What happened was faith didn't become possible. Faith was difficult. Living for God was hard. It was hoops to jump through, and it was all these crazy laws and all this crazy stuff. But yet when Jesus came, he broke it down, and he made it simple. He made it practical. He was unorthodox. He thought completely different. He taught completely different. He was this amazing, amazing teacher that could bring the ideas and the thoughts and the heart that he had down to any level. A simpleton or a sage could walk away with their mind expanded, their heart just blown up. I mean, how did he know? How did he speak such simple truth to me? Because that's what Jesus did. And you know, Jesus was always teaching. We see in the Bible that he taught multitudes. He taught thousands of people. Um, he taught small groups, right? He had a small group. We didn't even know that. He started fusion groups a long time ago. Right? He taught a small group of 12 guys that he taught everything. And then he had three guys that he taught even more. And then, and then he had individuals that he would go and he would teach and he would touch their lives and he would change them. And then my favorite people that he taught were the critics, the haters. Right? And man, he would mess their world up. He would ask them questions. He would reveal. He'd basically pull their pants down in public. Right? He would just <laughs> reveal, ha ha, you're an idiot. <laughs> Right, I mean, like right there in public, they're trying their best to get him. They're trying to corner him. They're trying to get him, and then bam, with one statement, with one word, he just reveals how much of an idiot they are. They have no idea. It's incredible that no matter what level, whether it's 15,000 people in one setting or whether it's one person with a, with a disease or one person with a problem, he's teaching at a different level with different people. The way that he does that is incredible. He knows people. And he teaches at their level. The words that he uses are at their level. He, 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 he breaks it down. He makes it so simple. And I love, too, that he does this, that he, a lot of times we see that he'll meet a physical need before he meets a spiritual need. That when he's, when he's with an individual we, or even with a group, he'll feed 15,000 people because he knows that if he can get to the spiritual need, then he can get to the spiritual need. I mean, if he can get to the physical need, then he can get to the spiritual need. It's exactly why we did Serve Day yesterday. Why, he, he modeled it. Jesus showed us how to do it. Hey, go meet their physical needs so that their heart will be open so that we can meet their spiritual needs. It's what he did. It's how he taught. He taught at a whole different level than anyone ever had before. This is what Jesus said, just some of the simple, practical things. He didn't get bogged down in all the religious nonsense, some of the practical things that he said. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough problems. Most of us know that. We've heard that before. It sticks. It stays in us. And we can say, you know what? Yeah, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just worry about today. I'm not going to focus on tomorrow. I know there's going to be things tomorrow, but today I'm just going to focus on taking steps with you today. I'm going to focus on your heart, what you want from me and my family. I'm going to keep walking after you. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow or next week or November 8th. Right? I'm going to worry about right now, God, because that's all, that's all I got right now is, is now, today. I'm going to put my faith and my hope and my trust in you. And Jesus said this. He just made it so simple. 
hey, no, no anxiety about tomorrow. Focus on today. Let's get through today. Let's power through with God. Let's, let's pursue God today. Another thing that he said that we know is if you're mad at someone, don't come to church and pretend. Get over it first. Get it right first. Go fix the problem first. It's so simple. Hey, listen, if you're going to come up in here and you're mad at your brother or your sister, then just don't because you're pretending. You're faking. Don't even go to your small group. Unless you're willing to go get it right first, then, then you can come in. Then you can worship. Then you can be a part. He says this. He says, you can't serve God and money at the same time. He says, you can't have two masters at the same time. You can't be after the world and possessions and portfolios and bank accounts and stuff and also be about God. You've got to choose one. You can't serve both. He says this. He says, the first is going to be last, and the last is going to end up first. We've heard this, right? Because he just packaged it in such a way that he said, hey, listen, don't be worried about being the most famous, the most popular, you know, the, the guy that's out front with everything. Why don't you serve people? Why don't you get back on the back and just love people and serve people, and then God will elevate you. He'll bless you. He'll bring you to where you need to go. But he just made it so simple. And you look at the scribes and all this stuff, and they had all they had 600 laws and all this stuff that they had to go through. And Jesus just said, no, 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 man, here it is. It's practical, it's simple, it's things that you can live out in your life right now. Here it is, it's possible. In this day and age, with all the laws and all the rules, they didn't even think living for God was possible. It was too complicated, but Jesus came along and made it simple. D.L. Moody said this, he said, The Bible was not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. The goal is Christ-like character. It's not about knowledge, it's about Christ-like character. We'll say it this way today. Jesus isn't just trying to increase our knowledge, he wants to change life. See, in the day, they were more concerned with knowledge, they were more concerned with knowing everything about the Scriptures instead of knowing the one the Scriptures are about. Instead of actually having a changed life, instead of actually your life being different because you know him. Knowledge is great, but if it's not sending you toward Jesus, then it's wrong. It's wrong. Knowledge should just serve that idea of I want to get to know him more. I want my life to be changed. I want to be a different person. The goal of Christ is for you to have a new character, a new life, a renewed sense of vision and purpose, not just a whole bunch of head knowledge. He wants you to know how to live out your faith so that you can be changed. The third thing that made Jesus different, and quite possibly my favorite, is that he was unboring. He was unboring. And that's actually not a word, by the way. <clears throat> it is today. Um, he, was, he wasn't boring. I mean, you could just imagine all the things we've talked about, about the scribes and the rabbis, how they would just sit for hours and just recite and go back through the same material. They had the same sermons. They'd go over and over and over again. It was just this boring and dead and lifeless way of learning the truth of God's word. And Jesus came along, and we know Jesus came along and he just flipped all of that. He changed all that. He spoke with such passion and creativity, which honestly is the reason why I think creativity is such a big deal in the church today and in our church. It's because Jesus Christ was creative. The way that he spoke, the way that he opened the word up, the way that he taught people was so creative. And our God, who is a creative God, created us in his image. So we're creative. And now all of our creativity, we're, we're expressing a nature that God gave us. And Jesus showed us how to live this because, again, he was the author of life, right? And I love this, that um, because in his creativity, he brought the word to life. That's the best way to say it. In his creativity, he brought the word to life, which is interesting because he literally is the word brought to life. John 1.14 says this, that the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. So the word of God became Jesus Christ and moved into the neighborhood. So the fact of him coming into the neighborhood and actually teaching in a creative way just was second nature to him. That's what he did. That's what he does. That's how he rolls. That's what's up. I mean, that is, that is who he is. He is the word come to life. So whenever he taught, he taught with this same creativity that came from Father God that, that is inside him, that is in the image of God, and he just taught that way. And he brought the word to life. I, I kind of liken it like this, that up to this point, the, the kids of Israel, they had been eating bland food. They had been eating white rice and hummus. I don't know. Right? And at this point, Jesus introduces sweet tea. 
Jesus introduces sweet potato souffle. I brought that up two weeks ago too. Y'all remember that? That stuff's good. <laughs> At this point, Jesus introduces chocolate. Right? I mean, he introduces this rich, flavorful meal. And all they had had up to this point was just boring and lame. Why would I want to serve that God? Why would I want to follow that God? It's rules, it's regulations, it's lame. But yet over here, there's life, and there's creativity, and there's this heartbeat that just jumps out of his chest for the people that are listening. It's amazing, it's rich, and it's full of life. And Jesus did two things whenever he taught with creativity. He, he painted pictures and he shared stories. And man, you can read and you can just, your mind can be open. And every single time you read it, it's alive. And every time you read it, you'll hear something different. You'll get something different. A couple of the pictures that he painted, one particular one is, um, is you, can, you know what, close your eyes for a second. And just, and just imagine with me for a second. Every campus, close your eyes. Now just imagine that you're standing next to a camel. Okay, there's this massive camel. They're way taller than you. Don't make it some little miniature camel, okay? They're big. Put a couple humps on his back, however many you think, whatever you want. I don't think they have three hump camels, so stick with one or two. Don't, don't deform your, your camel. Okay, and then I want, you know what, just go ahead and climb on top of it. Throw a saddle on top of it. Get on top of that, that massive camel. And then look down in your right hand, and you're actually holding a needle. And this is what Jesus tells the people, because they know camels. They get this. He tells the people that it would be easier for that camel to go through the eye of that needle than it would for a rich man to go to heaven. He just, he, he opened their mind to go, that's impossible. There's no way that I could take this massive beast and put it through this tiny, tiny little opening in a needle. You can look at me now. There's, it's impossible. So Jesus uses that and he goes, it's the exact same way for a man with a whole bunch of stuff, with a whole bunch of possessions, with a whole bunch of material things to get into heaven. And by the way, if your household makes more than $20,000 a year, then you're like in the richest, four, like you're more rich than four-fifths of the world, if you didn't know that. Right? We're wealthy people. We're blessed. Amen. Amen. Right? We're, we're blessed. But, but he said, listen, if you're caught up in that and that's what you're all about, you'll never get into heaven. Another thing that he said, and actually said this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, after he had taught all of this stuff, he said, if you listen to me, but you don't do what I said, then it's exactly like building your house on sand. So get that picture in your head. Let's go down to Gulf Shores. Let's find us a nice stretch of white sand that's not been developed yet, if that's existing down there right now, right? And let's just take our little two-by-fours, take our little, you know, all of our lumber and all of our stuff, and we're just going to go find us a nice little block of sand, and I'm going to build me a 3,000-square-foot house, four-bedroom, three-bath. It's going to be awesome. And then what happens three days later? The tide comes in, the sand shifts, things begin to change, and what happens? It crumbles. He said, but if you listen to my words and you do them, it's like you built that house on a rock. And no matter how much the sand shifts, no matter how much the world around you changes, no matter how much the tide comes in or the tide goes out, how, how much money you make, how little money you make, I mean, we take it wherever we want to, right? No matter what happens in your life, if you build it on the words that I've spoken, then it's like you've built your house on a rock. Not just a rock, but the rock. Because Jesus painted pictures, man. He knew, he knew that we think that way, right? I'm a visual guy anyway. I just think that way. I think in pictures. The other thing that he did was he shared stories. And we've all, we all know the parables, right? We all know at least some of them. You've heard them. You know them to some degree. But man, the way that he would unpack stories and he would, he, the way he would pull people into these stories, I mean, he introduced drama and controversy through these stories. These are not just some nice little nursery rhymes. These were stories that went against culture. These were stories that pull things out that people are going, hey, wait a minute, pal, I don't know about that. But he spoke to people's lives through them. He, 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 could, he, could, he could put people into those stories and make them immediately think that. One particular one that I love is the Good Samaritan. And most of us know this story. Most of us know the Good Samaritan. And matter of fact, probably whenever you drive by somebody that's broken down on the side of the road, you think that guy needs a Good Samaritan. It ain't going to be me, but that guy needs a Good Samaritan right about now. Right? You just, you think that because we all know this story, but it's this amazing story about a guy 
about a man, and he was actually driving through downtown Mobile. And it was kind of a busy day, so he took kind of a side street and found himself at a stop sign, and these couple of guys came out of nowhere, man, and they opened his car door, hit him over the head with a pistol, and just threw him on the road. They jumped in his car, and they just took off. He just left him there. He's bleeding, he's unconscious, he's just there. And about that time, the Archbishop of Alabama drove by. I don't know why he's in town, but he was in town. And he drives by in his limo, and his driver's like, hey, sir, there's a, there's a man over here. Uh, he looks like he's, he's hurting. Should we stop? He said, man, I, I wish I could, but I can't. We've got that meeting right now. Um, let's go ahead and go. We need to get there. So they just keep on going. And, and then a few minutes later, this, this really young, hip pastor came by from this really cool church. they got campuses everywhere. They're just awesome. <laughs> and this guy came by, and, 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 but he was, he, was, he was late for first Wednesday. I mean, dude, he was excited about First Wednesday. Worship, the word, it's going to be awesome. He's excited. He sees the guy, and he's like, boy, I just, I should probably stop, but man, I don't want to be late. I love worship. Man, when that band gets going, and whoo, it's good, right? I just can't be late. You know what? I'm sure someone called 911. I'm sure someone's called 911, so he took off. And a few minutes later, this single mom was leaving her second job, and she had worked all through the night. She was tired. She was in a teeny tiny little car. And she sees the guy and she stops. And she says, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. So she, he's unconscious. So she drags his body into the car and she, as quick as she can, she drives to Mobile Infirmary. She pulls up to the ER. She gets him out. And she says, listen, I don't know his name. I don't know anything about him, but I will take care of everything. Just get this man help. Whatever it takes, get this man help. Jesus told this story, and then he asked this question. He said, so who showed compassion? Who was her neighbor? Who was actually that man's neighbor? Who showed compassion? Then Jesus tells us another story. He tells the story of the, the prodigal son, one of my absolute favorite stories. I'll kind of bring it into this day as well as I tell it, but most of us know this story, but there was a very wealthy, very successful CEO um, that has a company over Mobile, and he's got houses all over, down in Point Clear. I mean, he's just done very, very well for himself. He's got two boys, and his youngest boy had grown up knowing this life, growing up just expecting these things, living a very privileged life, and become quite a snob, become quite a brat. And one day, he turned 21, and he goes to his dad, and he says, Dad, I want to be my own man. I want to find me. I want to, I want to, I want to get out there in the world, and I want to do my own thing. So I want to cash in my trust fund so that I can go out into the world and find me. So with your money, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find me. And the dad says, okay, that's fine. Whatever you want to do. I'm not holding you prisoner. You're 21. You can do what you want to do. So he immediately jumps on a plane. He heads to Vegas. Right? So within a couple of months, he had burned through all this money on penthouse suites and drugs and prostitutes and gambling and all this stuff. He just kind of just, just went for it. And all of a sudden, one day, he woke up, and he was, his head was in a dumpster, and he was looking for food. And day after day, it was the only way he could get by. It was the only way that he could live. He was working some pitiful little job. He was digging out the dumpster for food, and then it just hit him one day. He's like, man, my dad's got thousands of employees. My dad's got this huge factory and all these employees. I mean, surely he would at least let me work for him. I mean, at least maybe he would just, just give me a job, let, put me through the whole process, interview me, be hard on me, just give me a job because they're doing way better than I'm doing. So he scrounges up enough coins, enough money, and he gets a Greyhound bus all the way from Vegas to Mobile. And all the way there, he's got a 30-hour ride or whatever, and he's thinking, and he's trying to come up with this, this, this apology. Man, how can I apologize to Dad? I mean, how can I, how can I apologize enough that he'll, that he'll at least give me a job, that he'll make it right? And the whole way he just processes and thinks and comes up with this speech. He comes up with this I'm sorry speech. He gets the mobile. He gets to the bus stop. He makes this walk, this long, several-mile walk to his dad's house. And he stands at the foot of this long driveway, big house up on the hill, this beautiful, beautiful place, and whew, takes a deep breath and starts walking speech ready. He's, he's, he's getting the speech going. He's getting everything going. And then all of a sudden the front door busts open and he just sees somebody running. He's like, what in the world? Did they call the police? Did they call security? Like what's happening right now? And then as the man gets closer and closer, he realizes, I think that's dad. I think that's my dad. And 
I bet he's angry. I bet he's mad. And he starts ramping up the speech. He starts getting prepared. And he's going to catch him before he gets there with a quick, I'm sorry. And he's ready. And then all of a sudden he realizes dad's smiling. What in the world? And dad runs and just bear hugs him. Just grabs him. And he's loving on him. He's kissing him. Quit, dad. He's loving on him. He just gives him everything. And the kid keeps trying to say, dad, I'm sorry. And he won't even let him. He's like, no, 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 man, come up here. Come up to the house. Let me show you what I did to your room. I mean, I completely redid your room and come out here to the garage. I got you a brand new car. Look at all this stuff. He picks out, he, he grabs his cell phone. He calls all of his friends and goes, guys, my boy's home tonight in my house. We are throwing down. It's going to be incredible. Everybody get to my house tonight because my boy is home. Then he pulls out his iPhone and he goes to Facebook app. <laughs> and he becomes one of those annoying people that posts way too often. And he starts going, my boy is home, my boy is home, my boy is home, my boy is home. He pulls out his selfie stick. <laughs> my boy is home, my boy is home. And he's just so excited he can't stand it. He's so excited. But the son never got to make his I'm sorry speech. You know why? Because the father had been working on his welcome home speech for way longer than the son had been working on his I'm sorry speech. No matter if you lived 2,000 years ago or you live today, that story reach out, reaches out and grabs you. And the heart of the Father comes through and he says, you know what, no matter what you're dealing with, where you are, how far you've run, I'm there for you. My arms are open wide to you. And I guarantee you there are people in this room or at the other campuses right now that are going, I'm that son. I'm that daughter. I'm distant. I'm far away. I've run from God. And today I want you to know, man, he's waiting for you. He's got his welcome home speech ready. His arms are open wide and he's ready to take you back in. Can you understand just a little bit of how Jesus revolutionized the world through his teaching? Through opening these things up and people like you and me just sitting and listening to this and hearing this going, man, my heart is so open right now. I want to know the Father. I want to feel the embrace of the Father. Jesus taught with such and authenticity, such a passion, such a creativity that people were truly changed forever. That this movement began because of the things that he said, the things that he did. We've already talked about them, but let me go back through them real quick. He, he taught with authority because he was the author of life. He taught practically. He made it relevant to people. Everyday people could understand the truth of his word. And then he talked creatively. He brought the word to life because he was the word. And he could bring it to life in a way that no one even understood. And here's where I want to get today. Here's the main thing that I want you to walk away with. Not only was he a great teacher, but he was the perfect teacher. Because of this, because of who he was, he was the perfect teacher. But just as Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever... Jesus' teaching is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can't separate Jesus and his teaching. They're one and the same. It's his heart. It's who he is. It's his very life. It's who he is. And you can't separate it. So here's the thing. This is a digital Bible. But if those of you that have analog Bibles, you could say that the teachings of Jesus Christ are right there in your hand right now. The life of who he is, they're alive in your hand right now because they are the same today, yesterday, and forever. They are always there for us. And anytime we need this life, we can just dig into his word. We can dig into the red letters of his word. If, 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 if I were to say that next weekend we're going to have a guest speaker and uh, it's, it's going to be Jesus. Next weekend, special guest, tell the world, tell everybody, Jesus Christ is flesh and blood going to be here next weekend. You'd probably be here, right? Right? We would show up. We would want to see it. Is he wearing a white robe or is he wearing a purple robe? I'll, I got to know. Right? Like We would just want to know. We want to see him. We want to hear him. We want to know what's going on. Like We want to be here. What if I were to tell you that tomorrow morning when you have your chair time, Jesus Christ will show up? What if I were to tell you that tomorrow morning when you're driving to work, that if you want Jesus Christ to show up, Jesus Christ will show up because his word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And whenever you need Jesus, you can open up your Bible and you can find Jesus. You can find this same life-giving word that he wants for you today because he's the author of your life and he can speak to that individual thing. He can speak to your individual circumstance. Well, God, I got this family problem. He can speak to it. 
Well, God, I, I've got this financial problem. He can speak to it. He authored your life. He authored everything about you. He created you. He has the ultimate authority to speak into you. Let him. Here's a great little, little challenge for you. Pick up an analog Bible, an old school Bible, and spend about the next two or three weeks just reading red. Start just in the Gospels, man. Just page after page. Just read red. Just read the words of Jesus Christ. Because they are alive. And they are active. And they will reach out and grab your heart wherever you are. They will lead you. They will guide you. They will help you through whatever you're going through right now. Today. In our day. In our time. His word will speak to you. And whenever his word gets inside you. Whenever those things are alive in you. We'll say this. And this is my very last point. When you spend time with his words, you can replace what you feel with what he said. When you get the red letters in your heart, when you get his words in you and it becomes a part of you, then no matter what you wake up feeling in the morning, no matter what you, you feel tomorrow or what you think is going to happen or if it's fear or anxiety or worry, no matter what you feel, you can immediately replace it with what he said, the truth of his word, the truth of his actual words. And they're right there for us. They're right there with us. Every single day, whenever you want it, just open it up. And I guarantee you that Jesus Christ will speak to you. Because his words are alive and active. Before we close, I want to go back just a little bit to the prodigal son. I, I know that here or at other campuses, as I was telling that story, I feel like there's some of us in this room that identified with that son, identified as that daughter, maybe that you've been running from God, you're distant from God. I don't know how far away you are. Maybe it's just a few weeks. Maybe it's been years. But before we go on, before we move on, I have to give you the opportunity to run to the Father. I have to give you the opportunity to see those open arms and allow him to run to you. Because right now in this place, when you simply hold your hand up, he's there to hug you. He's there to wrap his arms around you. And he's going to give you the welcome home speech. He's going to love you the way you need to be loved, the way you should be loved. So if you'll bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment, if that's you today, and you say, yeah, today's the day I need to run. I need, I need him to run after me. I need to feel his embrace and know him. If that's you, slip your hand up right now. Don't be shy. Don't be timid. There's several hands here. I'm sure at the other campuses, there are hands going up right now. Here's what I want to do. I want us all to pray this prayer together. And those of you that raised your hand, I want you to dig deep and pray this with all that you've got. Let's pray. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and change my life. I'm coming to you today. I'm surrendering my life. And I want to feel your embrace. I want to know your love today. I give you my past. I give you my problems. I give you my heart. I give you my everything come into my life and change me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Isn't our God good? Can we thank God for all that he's done today? Thank you, God.